Hi everyone, we have derived the Black-Scholes model before. We know it assumes that the stock price follows a diffusion process, geometric Brownian to be precise. And as you know, we sometimes drop the subscript T to make it more readable. So we will be switching between the two presentation styles. Now these dynamics mean the log returns are normally distributed. But in most cases, when one plots the return distribution, it usually has fatter tails and taller peak compared to the normal distribution. Also, the actual prices show jumps whilst the diffusion process is smooth. So one of the ways to enhance the model to fit the empirical data is to add jumps to the process. And this is the model we're gonna discuss in this video. By the way, this Merton model was envisaged around the 1970s, so the smile wasn't the main concern. It became a concern in the late 80s, as you would know. But even in the smile models, the need for jumps doesn't go away. So you will see people add jumps to even the stochastic volatility models. For longer maturity option, one can live without jumps, but for shorter maturity, jumps can make a bigger difference because remember, Diffusion is a smooth process, so forcing it to reproduce the shorter maturity option prices can sometimes require very unusual parameter values. Now, when we talk about jumps, two things spring to mind, the jump arrival and the size of the jump. A natural approach would be to assume the jumps arrives according to Poisson process, and the size of the jump is log normally distributed in line with the Black-Scholes assumption. Let's start with the size, which we will represent by y. Say the stock price is s before the arrival of the jump. And when the jump arrives, the price changes to y times s. So y is in a way scaling factor. For example, if y equals 0 0.75, the post jump price will be 75% of the previous value. So it declines. And if it happened to be 1.25, then the post jump price would be 25% higher. Y is log normal, so it will take values larger than zero. We can calculate the change in price due to jump. So it is price after the jump minus price before the jump. And if we shift S to the left hand side, we see Y minus 1 represents the percentage change in the price due to jump. So we can add it to the Black-Scholes dynamics and let's move to the jump arrival, which as we said earlier, is assumed to follow a Poisson process. We have covered the Poisson process to death before. We saw one can define the Poisson process in several ways, but the definition in terms of the infinitesimal is more natural here. So let's reproduce the definition. Poisson process with intensity lambda is a process which starts at zero and has independent increments and the probability of one jump over a small interval is lambda times delta t and the probability of more than one jump for a small interval is negligible o of o of delta t to be precise. So n underscore t is the counter of jumps d and t which is like the change in the counter a small interval will take a value of 1 with probability lambda times dt or 0 with the remaining probability so we can multiply the jump size by dn now if a jump occurs dn will take a value of 1 and hence y minus 1 will be added to the relative change in stock price and if dn takes a value of 0 then the jump will not have an impact on price and by the way, it is assumed that the jump component is independent of the Brownian and the jump size is independent of the arrival. So we are essentially adding a compound Poisson to the Brownian motion. We have the Merton dynamics. Well, almost. We need a couple of more things. Firstly, the jump component will introduce a drift as well. It's easy to see if you take expected value of the jump. As Y and N are independent, we can write expected value of the product as the product of the expected values. Let's represent the expected value of y minus 1 by k. 
we shall link it to the parameters later on. And we know expected value of dn is equal to lambda times dt. So the jump adds a drift to the process. And if we subtract this from the process, then the jump component contribution will just be pure random jumps. Secondly, if the time interval is not too small, then more than one jump can occur. But it's no biggie. Say the price jumps by y1, then it jumps again by y2 and then by y3. So the price after the three jumps will just be s times the product of the three jumps. And the change in price as before will be price after the jumps minus price before the jumps. So if dn is greater than 1, then the relative change to be the product of the jumps minus 1. And we now have the dynamics in a more convenient shape. We can combine the dt terms and also shift s to the right hand side. And now it is as good as it can get for the application of the Eto's lemma. We know the Eto's lemma in its basic form. If f is the function of s, then its differential is equal to first derivative times ds plus half the second derivative times ds squared. We need to account for the jump, which is easy. You just add the change in the function value due to the jump. So value of f calculated using the price after the jump minus value of f calculated using the price before the jump. And we know from the GPM video that the continuous version of this equation is solved by applying Ito's lemma to the log of s. The motivation for log of s there came from the deterministic version of the differential equation and now we are carrying it over to the jump diffusion version. We know derivative of log of s is equal to 1 divided by s and the second derivative is equal to minus 1 divided by s squared and then in the jump part, we just replace the function f by log of s. Let's focus on the jump part for a bit. Log of a minus log of b is equal to log of a divided by b. The s is cancelled. And then log of product is equal to sum of logs. So we can replace the jump part by this simple sum. And we now focus on the continuous part. We need ds divided by s. So we just shift s to the left hand side and ds divided by s squared is then down to the eaters box dt times dt is 0 and so is dw times dt and dw squared is equal to dt so it reduces to just one term we have minus half times this so let's multiply both sides by minus 1 divided by 2 and now we can make the replacement we can combine the dt terms and leave the jump part as it is. Now let's integrate from 0 to t. Remember the three terms that depend on t. This is the stock price s, w and n. Then w0 is equal to 0 and so is n0 by definition. This is because both the Brownian and the Poisson process start at 0. Now remember y, which is the jump size factor, is assumed to be log normal, which means log of y is normal. Let's represent its mean and standard deviation by mu underscore y and sigma underscore y. Let's say we know the number of jumps is equal to n, then the summation term just represents sum of n random normal, which again will be normal. We will just need to add their means and variances because they are independent normals essentially multiply them by n as we are just dealing with n identical variables. Now the second random component wt is also normally distributed but with mean 0 and variance equal to t and then sigma times w is just a linear transformation of a normal so it will also be normal with mean 0 and variance equal to sigma squared times t. We can add the two components Again, sum of independent normals is normal. We add the means and variances because these variables are assumed to be independent. We can factor out t in the variance because we are aiming to express it in terms of Brownian. We can now write this in terms of the standard normal variable z. 
you can easily check that this transformation of z has the same distribution that we see in the line above it. And then square root of t times z has the same distribution as wt. And we can just replace the two random components by a linear transformation of a single Brownian. Remember, this is conditional on the number of jumps equal to n, but the problem has simplified a lot. We are almost in the Black-Scholes world. Remember, in the Black-Scholes, the log of stock price has these dynamics. So we hope that we can play with our equation to reduce it to this Black-Scholes form. The coefficients of W gets easily aligned if we just define a new constant. Now we need the minus 1 divided by 2 times the square of this term in the drift. So let's square it and then multiply both sides by minus 1 divided by 2. We already have 1 divided by 2 sigma squared so let's add and subtract the second term and we keep the rest the same. Now these terms are equal to minus 1 divided by sigma underscore n squared and of course the coefficient of w is equal to sigma underscore n. Let's highlight the terms corresponding to the black holes in green and let's separate them from the rest. Now the extra terms in the first set of brackets are constant so we can absorb them in the initial stock price but first let's exponentiate the two sides and now we can absorb the extra terms into the initial price. So we have the updated equation. And let's also write the black scholes in equivalent form. So we have something like black scholes, except the definition of the initial stock price and the volatility are different. This is because we kind of found a way to embed the jumps into the process. As you can see, we are almost there now. Remember, in the black scholes, the stock price under the risk neutral measure follows the same process but with drift equal to R. Merton assumed that the same logic will work for the jump diffusion. What Merton had in mind is the idiosyncratic jumps in the individual prices so he wasn't talking about the market crashes etc. He thus assumed that the jump risk is diversifiable and its own commander premium. As you know, in the presence of jumps, the markets are not complete because we can't hedge the jump risk, which means we won't have a unique martingale measure and one can choose a convenient martingale measure. Of course, this means merge logic won't work for options on indices. Now, we know the Black-Scholes formula. It's a function of the two variables, stock price and time to maturity, and three parameters in which we don't write so that it stays readable. The price under the Merton dynamics will then be given by the very same formula because the dynamics are the same except that the variable names are slightly different and we have a few more constant parameters. Notice this is conditional on the number of jumps equal to n but we can remove the conditioning by using the iterated expectation. The number of jumps can be anything from 0 to a large number so we condition on the number of possible jumps, calculate the price and then weighted by the probability of jumps taking that value and sum across all possible values. We know the number of jumps follows Poisson process and we know the Poisson density. So we can substitute the density and we have the merchant formula for the price of a European call option. And let's recall that sigma underscore n represents the total volatility per unit time due to diffusion and jump. S underscore N is the scale version of the initial stock price to account for some of the effects of the jumps. And also remember we define K as the expected value of the relative jump size. We can express it in terms of the input parameters. You can write Y as exponential of log of Y because log and exponential are inverse of each other. We can take the constant out of the expectation. We know log of y is normally distributed and we also know that the expected value of the exponential of a normal variable is equal to the exponential of mean and half the variance. So we have k in terms of the input parameters. One can also express this formula in an equivalent form in which the adjustments that we made to the initial stock price are reflected in the risk-free rates and the Poisson process intensity parameter instead but we can cover this in a sequel. Please give a thumbs up if you would like to see similar videos and I look forward to seeing you in the next.